All right, everybody, we're going to go ahead and get started tonight. Welcome to Reaching Out While Locked In, our beef webinar series. Um, we've been at this for quite some time now, and uh, unfortunately, we are still amongst the pandemic, so uh, we'll stick with it for a little bit longer. So um, do welcome everybody to tonight's uh, program. Tonight, uh, we have Dr. Katie Van Valen. She's our newest extension specialist, and she's housed down at the Princeton station. Uh, for those of you that have been with us for a while, she's on every week and, uh, and was one of the uh, presenters, early on presenters as well, and glad to have uh, Katie back tonight. And uh, her topic tonight is gonna be preparing for winter feeding. And so, uh, Dr. Van Valen, I'm going to turn it over to you. For those of you that are on, if you have a question, you can put it in the chat, uh, and then we'll get to, to the questions there at the end. So, um, Dr. Van Valen, it's all yours. Appreciate you joining us, and we'll talk to you in a little bit. You're, you're still muted. There we go. There okay. we go. All right. Yeah, we've been doing this Zoom thing for a while, but sometimes we still mess it up. So we're going to jump right in uh, tonight talking about uh, winter feeding for our cattle. And so when we think about winter feeding, you know, we got to think about the cool season grass base that we have in the state of Kentucky. Uh, when you look uh, across the calendar year from January to December, we can see that we have both at the tail ends of the year, we've got this decrease in overall yield. And so that's really where we've got to come in with a winter feeding program to make up for that loss in forage yield uh, from our cool season forage base. So before we can get into any particulars about a, a feeding program, I think it's important to think about the goals of the feeding program. Uh, so that might look different depending on what your herd looks like. So if spring calving herds, um, we're trying to maintain those cows through mid to late gestation. Um, some of those cows that maybe uh, calve earlier on in the spring certainly might still be, um, might go into early lactation. Fall calving herds, uh, we're maintaining lactating cows uh, throughout that winter feeding period. And then of course growing cattle, we've got to maintain an adequate rate of gain on those, cat, on those cattle. And so um, there's a lot of different factors that can affect the nutrient requirements of cattle. And one of those is stage of production. And so uh, if you look at this graph here across the uh, x-axis, across the bottom, we've got months uh, since calving. On the left axis, we've got the crude protein requirement. And so we can see that that crude protein requirement fluctuates quite a, quite a bit uh, throughout the calendar year uh, based on what her stage of production is at, if, at any given time. But in addition uh, to the stage of production and, and the factors are, or the effects that that can have on nutrient requirements, we also need to think about the environment that our cattle are in. And so um, environmental impacts on nutrient requirements can uh, be uh, pretty severe at times. Um, we are lucky that we don't have a ton of uh, cold stress here in the state of Kentucky compared to other places, um, but we do have situations where um, that weather during the, the winter feeding period can affect our cattle performance. And so uh, this is some work that's been, um, that was done back in the 80s, looking at the effects of a hair coat on the lower critical temperature of cattle. And so uh, when we think about the lower critical uh, temperature, that's the temperature at which uh, they can basically maintain um, or, or stay at maintenance. And so when uh, we look at that uh, summer hair coat or when we have a, a hair coat that gets wet, we can see that that lower critical temperature is, is quite high. It's actually up around 60 degrees. Uh, when we move into more of a transition or fall hair coat, uh, that lower critical temperature gets uh, a little bit lower. And then as we move into the winter hair coat or a heavy winter coat, um, again, that, that critical temperature uh, continues to fall. The blue line that I have going across there is actually the overall average temperature 
for the months of December, January, and February on a, um, a 10 year average for the average uh, t air temperature in the state of Kentucky. So uh, that's just looking overall at the entire state over 10 years during those typical winter months. And so uh, we can see that, especially when we end up in this, uh, when our cattle can end up with a wet hair coat, we can get into an issue where their lower critical temperature is actually higher than our ambient air temperature. Um, the other issue that we have in Kentucky that we deal with quite a bit is mud. And mud can really affect uh, energy requirements of our cattle because they've got to work a lot harder to get around and get through that mud, uh, maybe get up to the feed bunk if, we're, if we've got those cattle on feed. And so um, if you look, this is some work that was done out in Nebraska and they were uh, looking at uh, the potential losses and gain compared to if we had no mud at all. So if there was no mud, let's say that they're at 100%. And so as the depth of that mud increases, you can see that their potential gain decreases. And it decreases pretty significantly as that mud increases. So it's about a 7% drop for each of the different depths that they looked at. And these depths, are, again, are just based off of um, relative to, to where the mud comes up on the animal versus a, a specific uh, depth in inches. And I also point out that they looked at this in, temp in terms of uh, air temperatures from 21 to 39 degrees Fahrenheit. So certainly uh, temperatures that would be relevant to uh, cattle production here in Kentucky, uh, even though this work was done uh, in Nebraska, which can be have much colder climate than here. So there's a lot of factors that affect nutrient requirements of our cattle. Uh, but when we think about uh, moving into what that winter feeding program is going to look like, one of the biggest things that we can do is work to extend the grazing season. And here in Kentucky, we've got a tall fescue forage base. And, you know, we've spent a lot of time doing a lot of research, <laughs> trying to figure out how to uh, improve cattle production in light of uh, the endophyte infected fescue that we have. And so, you know, we can focus on the negatives of the grass, but the grass does have positives and that's that it's an excellent grass for stockpiling. And so this is something that, that we should look at as a, as a potential way to cut down on our stored feed use. Uh, stockpiling tall fescue uh, can be a good high quality feed source, not only for fall calving cows, uh, potentially for some uh, thin spring calving cows if we're trying to put some condition back on those animals. Uh, it may be a little bit more nutrient dense than uh, our spring calving cows that are in good condition might need. Uh, we can also, um, it can also support gains for uh, stalker and backgrounder calves as well. So when we look at uh, stockpiling tall fescue, uh, this is uh, just a general timeline of what we're looking at. So it tends to start, uh, we need to start this process earlier. So late July, early August. So uh, again, it's not something we could start now, but it is something that we can look forward to in the future. And so uh, if we look, um, if we start in late July to early August, one of the things that we want to do at that point is graze or clip the pasture down to about three to four inches in height. So that way we've got some new fresh growth um, coming on during our stockpiling phase. And then we need to remove the cattle and, and keep all of our livestock off of those pastures that we're going to stockpile. In early to mid August, we want to, uh, you can apply nitrogen. Um, and that is the best time to apply nitrogen to have the greatest nitrogen efficiency, which ultimately leads to improved yields and quality. And so if you look at this table over here, this is some work that was uh, done back in the 70s, but they looked at different uh, rates of nitrogen application on stockpiled fescue. Uh, and then they, so they looked at the yield and the crude protein uh, content of the, the stockpiled forage uh, on December 1st of that year. And so you can see as they increase nitrogen, they increase yield and crude protein content. Um, applying the work um, that was done to look at, at when to apply the nitrogen was actually done at the research center in Princeton. And they looked at 
uh, whether they applied nitrogen on August 1st, August 15th, September 1st, or October 1st. And again, they see the greatest um, efficiency when that nitrogen was applied on August 1st to August 15th uh, compared to that September 1st or October 1st date. However, applying the nitrogen later will still lead to some improvements in uh, yield in those cases. Uh, so then when it comes time to put the cattle back on and begin grazing, um, you know, that's sometime around November or December uh, based on, on the year. Uh, it's best to implement a strip grazing um, system, and that's going to allow for the best forage utilization. Uh, if we just turn the cattle out on the entire pasture, uh, we're going to lose some of that uh, fescue that we worked to stockpile due to trampling. And so um, implementing a strip grazing system can be relatively easily easy if you start at the water source and work your way out. Uh, we're not where it's different from a rotational grazing system. We're not worried so much about the cattle being able to go back to where they started because uh, we're not trying to, to keep the cattle off of that uh, forage that they've already consumed. And so um, we want to allow those cattle to have a couple days worth of grass at a time. And, you know, I've had conversations with some of my colleagues over uh, that are forage specialists on how do you how do you choose exactly how much grass uh, to allow the cattle to have? And that can kind of uh, depend. And it may take a little bit of trial or error the first you know, week or so as you're starting this strip grazing system. Um, and so if you have any additional questions on, on stockpiling fescue, uh, Dr. Chris Toich actually did a, a nice video on this for our virtual beef bash. So those resources are out there as well, um, talking about some options with stockpiling tall fescue. So there was some research done actually uh, in Missouri looking at the impacts of, of properly managed stockpiled fescue. And in that scenario, they were actually able to decrease hay feeding by 50%, uh, which ultimately decreased their winter feed costs on a per head per day basis by 35%. Uh, and some of that research, uh, the stockpiled fescue supported average daily gains of about one and a half to two and a half pounds per day in calves. And then in looking at uh, dry cows, so these are uh, cows that were allowed to graze the stockpiled fescue from November to February, and they were expected to calve in March. Uh, they had gains of about one and a quarter pounds per day. And over that period, they gained about 119 uh, pounds per cow. Uh, they did have to supplement a little bit of hay throughout there, about 500 pounds an animal, uh, but that, uh, increase of 119 pounds of gain uh, per animal would be enough to increase that animal by one body condition score if we think about it taking about 100 pounds uh, to increase a single body condition score. So as I mentioned earlier, those spring calves that maybe aren't in the best of condition, turning them out on the stockpiled fescue may be a way uh, to get them to improve body condition score before they move into, before they calve and get into lactation where they get at a point where it's going to be difficult to, to change your body condition score at that point because their energy and protein requirements have increased so much. So it's going to be really difficult to, to try to graze 365 days of the year. And so it's, we're still going to rely on stored feeds for winter feeding. And so when I think about stored feeds or maybe more pro appropriately store for, stored forages, Think about grass haze, um, baleage or haylage, which is an ensiled uh, feed stuff, and then also corn silage. So we're gonna go through and talk about some of these in a little bit more uh, detail. So the number one factor that affects forage quality is stage of maturity. And so uh, I, wanna, I want you to keep that in mind as we move through uh, some of the discussion on our different uh, stored feed sources. And so this is a, an image that I use in a lot of my presentations, so, and you may have seen it before, um, but at, it just shows that as we move, as the plant uh, progresses in maturity, we can see that uh, crude protein content decreases uh, and the amount of fiber increases. And then as that fiber increases, it can actually decrease, actually decreases the digestibility of the forage. Um, so again, this is the number one factor that can ultimately affect uh, the quality of the forage that 
uh, we are providing to our cattle. So when we're comparing uh, dry hay to uh, an ensiled uh, feedstuff like baleage, um, one of the advantages that baleage can have over dry hay is uh, a reduction in dry matter storage losses. Uh, so dry hay can be up to about a 30% loss and baleage can be more in that five to 10%. Um, the other advantage that baleage can have is the number of days it's needed to produce the product. And so uh, dry hay, you know, we need to find those hay making windows of, you know, about three days. Whereas with baleage, we're not, we don't need the forage to dry down quite as much. So we can get it done in a single day. And in fact, we need to get it done in a single day, get it wrapped uh, so we don't run into issues of spoilage. Um, one of the drawbacks, of course, with baleage is we do have to have uh, specialized equipment. We do have to be able to get it wrapped. Um, and the other, uh, another point on baleage to consider is that when we put baleage out for our cattle, we want them to be able to consume that in about 48 to 72 hours. So uh, if we're putting out a, a single bale, we need to um, make sure that they're going to be, we have enough animals uh, that have access to that bale to consume it in 48 to 72 hours. But one of the advantages that baleage can have uh, because of that um, decreased dry matter loss that we actually have um, are able to maintain more of the leaves on the forage plant, uh, we can actually see some improvements in crude protein uh, and energy requirements. So this is some work that was done out of Florida uh, where they looked at either dry hay either producing dry hay or baleage from the same uh, field. And so they, and then they looked at quality of those two um, feedstuffs. And so you can see the, the increased crude protein and TDN or energy content um, of the baleage there. The other thing about the a baleage system is like I mentioned, we don't have to have that uh, as quite as long of a, a dry window. And so being set up to, to potentially produce both dry hay and baleage um, might allow you to get a more optimal um, stage of maturity when um, it will allow you to get a more optimal stage of maturity uh, when, when deciding to harvest that forage. Also wanted to talk a little bit about corn silage. Um, corn silage can be a really good, a really nice feedstuff. Um, there's a lot of um, silage specific varieties of corn um, that can improve the overall digestibility of the feedstuff. Uh, the grain to forage ratio with corn silage can vary quite a bit, but we kind of expect it to be in that 40 to 55% um, grain range. And so that leaves us with a pretty high energy feedstuff of about 70% TDN. One of the issues with corn silage though uh, is that it is deficient in protein uh, for most classes of cattle. Uh, typically, we're going to see that analyze around 8%, maybe around 7%. Um, so one of the mistakes that, that people can often make with corn silage is uh, thinking that just putting out corn silage is going to get the job done. But if we're still protein deficient, you know, we're not meeting the nutritional needs of cattle. So um, an additional protein source, something maybe like a dried distillers grain will also be uh, required to mix in with the corn silage in most cases. Uh, some further considerations when thinking about utilizing corn silage, uh, the increased starch compared to some of the other stored forages means that we're going to have to transition those cattle to so starting them at about 1% of, of their body weight on an as-fed basis and then we increase them by about five pounds every three to four days. It's a general recommendation uh, so we don't get into a situation uh, with digestive issues like acidosis. Um, another consideration, of course, is storage. There's a lot of, um, there's several different options. Um, the biggest thing is that we need to consider how much we're going to be feeding daily uh, to make sure that we can maintain a, a fresh uh, face to our silage. Um, upright silos um, are a little bit easier to maintain a fresh silage face, but they're certainly slower to uh, fill and feed out and can have some of the greatest maintenance costs when we compare them to something like a bunker or a bag. Uh, we eat, feed corn silage out of an upright silo at the research center in Princeton. And I know it takes about 30 or 40 minutes uh, for our guys to, to fill their, their silage wagon to feed about our 150 
or so cows that we maintain throughout the winter. So just to give you an idea of what that, what that looks like. Uh, silage needs to be consumed within about 24 hours uh, after we've put it out. So that means that you're looking at daily feeding um, to, to make sure that that silage stays fresh. Uh, so uh, those are just some considerations that you need to think about before uh, maybe jumping into corn silage. But again, it's an excellent energy source um, and can be a really economical feed, store, feed source uh, for us, especially uh, for you know, some of our producers that you know, maybe have some good crop ground as part of their overall operation. So regardless of what type of, of stored forage uh, that you uh, want, are wanting to utilize in your operation, um, we need to know the quality of the forage. And so how do we know what the quality of forage is? And I'll hear people say all the time, oh, oh, that hay looks good or it smells good. And yes, those can be general indicators of quality, but we don't really know unless we get it tested. So sending in a forage test is the only way to truly evaluate the nutritional quality of a, of a um, stored forage. So again, whether we're talking about dry hay or baleage or corn silage, uh, when should forages be tested? Um, in general, we want samples to be sent out as close to the time that we're gonna feed them uh, or when our nutritional management decisions are being made. Um, so again, uh, in terms of nutritional management decisions that you might be looking at, you know, trying to figure out what supplemental feeds you want to be feeding. Uh, again, you're not going to know what supplemental feeds you need until we get them, get the hay tested. Um, we want to make sure that we get those samples sent in uh, as close to the time that they've been collected, especially if we're sending in a baleage or corn silage types uh, sample. Those samples have a lot more moisture in them. And so, um, we don't want those uh, samples to get moldy or, or spoil along the way. Uh, so avoid collecting or sending samples later in the week or around holidays is a general consideration. So uh, I have on here hay samples, but this is gonna be true for, for any feed sample that you're sending in. Your test results are only gonna be as good as the sample that you submit. Uh, so just a few tips for collecting representative uh, samples. If we're collecting hay samples, we want to use a good probe. Uh, so I've got an example here of, of a hay testing probe. Uh, work with your county agents on this. Most of our counties, or a lot of our counties, I should say, have uh, hay probes that they can rent out or they can, um, your agent may be able to come out to your operation and help you get those samples collected. We want to sample randomly within a single lot. So a lot of hay is defined as hay that was uh, produced on the same day out of the same field. Uh, and so under the same conditions, we want to take enough uh, core samples to have that representative sample. So about 20 sample or 20 cores per lot. And you're going to want to sample all the lots of hay that you've got on that you've produced throughout the year. Again, store those samples in a plastic bag and keep them in a cool or dry place. So now that we've got our uh, sample collected, it's important to uh, think about where we're going to send these samples and selecting a test. And again, I have on here to work with your county agent because a lot of our counties do have a forage testing program uh, so they can help you get those samples submitted. Um, I have on here just a couple uh, forage testing labs. And then I wanted to touch a little bit on uh, NIR versus wet chemistry. So NIR being, being near infrared spectroscopy uh, versus a traditional wet chemistry um, test. Uh, one of the biggest things that you're going to find is that there's a, it can be a pretty significant difference in cost. However, um, with NIR, uh, we're using a lot of equations and to estimate uh, nutritional content of the forage versus uh, a wet chemistry um, analysis. And so especially on things like minerals can be uh, not so reliable on an NIR system. So um, in general, in, as a hay test is better than no hay test, um, but certainly wet chemistry uh, is a little bit more tried and true uh, than the NIR. But the NIR equations are con uh, consistently or constantly getting better and improved. So. So now that we've got the hay tested, 
now what? Uh, so I want to walk through a little bit about understanding a forage analysis. So this is a sample of forage analysis results that you might get. Um, there can be a lot of information. Again, this is an example from uh, the Dairy One laboratory. Uh, there's a lot of information on this, on this uh, readout. Um, so don't get overwhelmed by that information. Um, there's some critical pieces of information on here. Um, so those would be things like dry matter, crude protein or CP, neutral detergent fiber or NDF, uh, and total digestible nutrients or TDN um, would be some things that, that you definitely want to make sure are on your hay test. So if you use a different lab than say this one that I'm using as an example, again, those are things to, to look for in, in terms of what information you're going to get back. So when we are comparing hay samples or comparing really any feed sample, we always want to look um, at the dry matter values. So you'll get um, two sets of numbers back. Typically, they may say as sampled or as fed versus dry matter. Uh, the biggest thing, the reason we want to look at a dry matter basis is it puts everything on a level playing field. Uh, so we take all the water out and we can look at what's left. Uh, so we know that there's a lot of differences in water content of feeds, uh, especially if we're considering something like corn silage versus grain corn. Those are two extremes. Um, but even within uh, haze that we send in, you know, we can see some very vari variation in that dry matter content. And so we need to make sure we look at the results on the dry matter basis so that uh, we're comparing apples to apples. Um, the dry matter values are going to be larger uh, because they're more concentrated because we took out that water. Uh, typical hay dry matters are going to be in that 88 to 90 percent range. Uh, so that's again just something for you to uh, just kind of a reference of, of what typical uh, might look like. So on some uh, results that you'll get back, there can be a lot of different protein values. Um, and so some may just have crude protein on there and some may have a bunch of different values. And so I wanted to go over uh, what do they mean and which one to use. So uh, crude protein is sort of our, our standard measure of protein. Uh, ADICP is a measure of damage or unavailable protein. So when they go to calculate available crude protein, that's just the crude protein value minus the ADICP uh, value. And then uh, sometimes you might see this adjusted crude protein, which uses an, avail an equation based on the ADICP value. Uh, so bottom line is when given, uh, use available crude protein, um, otherwise use cr the crude protein value. So um, this is a really, uh, a an oversimplification a little bit, but when we're talking about mature cows, we've got the 7911 rule which is that uh, at mid gestation, they require some about 7% crude protein, 9% uh, during late gestation, 11% during lactation. Again, we talked about a bunch of different factors uh, and factors that can affect nutrient requirements. So keep that in mind. And again, these are just kind of a, a ballpark rule of thumb. Uh, I have on here exceptions, including heifers and growing cattle. So again, these are, are specific to mature cows. Our heifers and growing cattle, they are uh, trying to, uh, they're continuing to grow in addition to these other uh, demands that we've put on them, uh, such as pregnancy and lactation. So their requirements are gonna be a little bit um, higher. There's a lot of different options when it comes to supplementing protein, um, but there can be a wide variety of costs as well. So I have on here just a couple examples, uh, being uh, dried distillers grains, and I have on here a, a protein tub as well. Again, there's lots of different um, options for supplementing protein, but the question uh, can really come down to cost and what do you actually need? So we'll touch on that more uh, here in a little bit. Uh, so when we're looking at, at energy, um, TDN or total digestible nutrients is a measure of energy. And I think of this as kind of the user-friendly value. Um, there's also net energy for lactation, maintenance, and gain. So these NEL, NEM, and NEG, those are also measures of, of energy. And uh, if you're going to uh, submit your 
your hay tests and work with a nutritionist, they may uh, want to have uh, those values to work with you to work with. Um, energy is going to be our most efficient nutrient in hay. Um, and can be uh, somewhat difficult to supplement just because we've got to come up with with some feeds that can uh, fit the bill uh, without uh, causing digestive issues as well. So again, we'll touch on that. Uh, I've got some examples of, of going through and selecting some supplements uh, here in, in a few slides. So we'll touch on that in a minute. So again, just a ballpark rule um, for TDN. This 50, 55, 60 for mid gestation, late gestation, and lactation. And I put on here again the exceptions being heifers and, and growing cattle because, of course, they've got to, they're going to have a little bit higher requirement because they've got to uh, still grow while doing all these other, while supporting gestation and lactation. And then lastly, I've got fiber on here. So NDF is one of the fiber values, and we can kind of use that to estimate feed intake. Uh, so if we think about intake on a percentage of body weight basis, um, we can, do, if you take 120 and divide that by the NDF value, that's about how much feed the animal's going to be able to consume on a percent of their uh, body weight. And really what that has to do with is uh, as that NDF value increases, the digestibility of the forage is going to decrease, uh, which can uh decrease the, how quickly it can move through the, the GI tract, meaning that our animals are going to feel fuller for longer, which is why they're not able to consume quite as much um, forage in that situation. Uh, so again, these are some, some rules of thumb for NDF when we're talking about uh, a legume a hay. Uh, in general, less than 40% would be what we would consider good quality, while greater than 50% would be a lower quality and on grass hay, we're looking at less than 50% being good quality and greater than 60% being a poor quality uh, grass hay in that situation. Uh, ADF is a is acid detergent fiber that's uh, also um, that also follows uh, NDF. So um, if NDF in one hay sample is higher, the ADF value should also be higher when comparing it to another sample. Uh, just some general rules on uh, acceptable ADF values for legume uh, based hay is 20 uh, to mid 30s and then grass hay is 30 to mid 40s percent wise. So then the question becomes, do I need to supplement my hay? And ultimately what we're trying to figure out is does the hay meet the requirements of our cattle? And so it, in this little graph that I put here, I show um, this hay A uh, fully meeting the, the crude protein requirements for our cattle, whereas maybe hay B is, is falling a little short, but how much do I, but the supplement is just there to fill in that gap. Uh, so we need to think about that and remember that we're just filling in the gaps with supplements um, and really using that forage as our base. So to supplement or not. So I put up here two hays, uh, hay test results. I pulled out uh, the relevant information from, a, from some hay test results. Um, and I've got hay A and hay B. And so if we look, they're pretty similar. They're, they're identical on dry matter. We've got a little bit of difference in crude protein. Uh, NDF values, again, are a little bit different and then some differences in TDN, but in general, they're kind of, they're pretty similar with where they're at. Down here at the bottom, I've listed those um, ballpark numbers for mid, late, uh, mid gestation, late gestation, and lactation. And so if we're looking at mid gestation, both of these hays are going to fit the bill. They're going to get the job done. And in general, we shouldn't need to supplement them. Now, as we move into looking at late gestation, again, both of these are um, getting the job done. Um, we shouldn't have to supplement, but I do wanna point out, if you look at hay A in terms of TDN, it's just barely meeting that ballpark requirement and same thing um, for hay B on crude protein. And so remember that um, our hay test results are only as good as the sample that we submitted. And so ultimately um, we may still need to supplement and we really need to pay attention to, to uh, body condition score. Um, of our cattle. So 
Uh, these again are of course just estimates and we know that there's a lot of different uh, factors including animal to animal variation and, and environment that can impact the, the nutrient requirements. But then when we move into lactation, we see that neither one of these hays are gonna get the job done uh, in terms of both crude protein and energy. And it's pretty darn difficult to, to do that, uh, to meet both protein and energy requirements of a lactating cow with a grass hay. So uh, this doesn't necessarily mean that these are, are bad quality hays or bad hay samples. Um, it's just pretty darn hard to meet the, the lactation uh, pro crude protein and energy requirements with, with a grass hay. So the, so UK has a beef cow forage supplement tool. And so I put the website in there, but if you just do a Google search for, for that, you will come up with uh, this webpage. So it'll look like this when you click on it. And the, the cow or the tool makes some um, assumptions. So it assumes about a 1250 pound cow and it estimates speed intake uh, using that 120 divided by the forage NDF estimate. And so, the, uh, so of course you'll need an NDF value from your hay test result. And then the other information that you'll need to use this calculator is dry matter, crude protein, TDN, and then the stage of production uh, that you are, are wanting to evaluate for. So just to show you what the, the results would look like, uh, you can go in and select either particular supplements on there that we have listed, or you can select all of them. So that's what I've done here. And just as we um, pointed out on the previous slide, uh, if I put in hay A for mid gestation, it comes back and tells me that we don't need to uh, supplement anything to meet those protein and energy requirements of that cow. But when we go in and look at lactation, just like we said, we're gonna need to supplement. And so you can see here that it gives you a, a bunch of different options and gives you some amounts um, to start with uh, for supplementing your cows when feeding this, feeding this particular hay based on the results that you put in. And then we see here, uh, we've got hay B and we see we get this, we get this list of, of results. And I wanna point out here that we've got this NA value for corn. And you can see over here on the left that we've got a bunch of different um, maximum values that we put in for each of the feedstuffs. And that's really just, um, we put those in there kind of as a, a safety net. So uh, you can see that we got that NA value for corn. That means it would take more than six pounds of corn uh, to meet both the protein and energy requirements of hay B for um, a mature cow during lactation. So uh, then you can look towards some of these other uh, feedstuffs, other commodities uh, and, and choose to utilize one of those instead. But I wanna walk through this a, a little bit uh, more. And so uh, if we look at hay A and hay B, I pulled out the, um, the, the results it gave us for corn, um, gluten, dried distillers grains and soy hulls uh, from the, those previous screens. I've got those up there. And if you look, uh, you can see that in general, hay B, we're gonna have to supplement quite a bit more than hay A. Um, I pulled this data, this has probably been about a month or so ago now. Um, I've got uh, commodity costs for uh, the different feedstuffs from the uh, supplier that we utilize uh, with our cow herd. And so I've got those on a price per ton basis. And then I divide that by 2000 and put it on a price per pound basis. So you can see um, that corn is the cheapest on a price per pound basis uh, with dried distillers being the most expensive uh, based on this list of feeds. Uh, so then I went through and I basically took that price per pound and multiplied that by uh, the amount that the calculator said that we should supplement in pounds and multiply that by 30 to find the cost to supplement 30 cows for 30 days. And so if we look at uh, the results, we see across the board, uh, hay B is more expensive to supplement than hay A. But if we remember, hay B met the nutritional requirements of that mid and less, 
mid and late gestating cow. And so this is where we make some decisions to say, that's the hay that we need to feed during mid and late gestation or feed to, whereas hay A, they're, neither one of them is gonna get the job done for lactation, but if we're feeding hay A, it's gonna be quite a bit cheaper. And so that's the one that we would wanna feed during lactation. Now, if we also remember that on a price per ton basis, uh, the corn was the most expensive, whereas dried distillers, or I'm sorry, corn was the cheapest, whereas dried distillers was most expensive. But when we look at what it actually costs to supplement per day, we can see that we uh, that now dried distillers is actually the more economical choice. Um, and that's just because the nutritional profile of dried distillers in this case uh, more closely um, complements the nutritional profile of the hay that we're using. Uh, so we're just a little short on protein, but we're quite a bit more short on uh, energy in this case. And so dried distillers is gonna have more protein than um, compared to corn. And so that's why it ends up being quite a bit cheaper. So again, um, it's good to go through and, and look at some of these calculations uh, because just because something is cheaper on a price per ton basis doesn't necessarily mean it's gonna be cheaper to feed uh, based on your given situation. But ultimately we need to manage for body condition score. Um, so these are all estimates uh, that calculator is, is a rough estimate. Like I said, it, it told us we didn't need to supplement those hays for late gestation, but you know, maybe we, we might if, if she ends up losing some body condition on us. And so uh, again, we wanna kind of shoot for, for this middle of the road cow here, this middle picture um, and adjust the supplement as needed. Uh, so that calculator should, should be a, a useful tool though uh, to get you started. And again, that it's all based off of mature cows, uh, not heifers, because of course they are still growing and their requirements are gonna be a bit higher. So our takeaway points, uh, first and foremost, we should try to take advantage of extending the grazing, our grazing season as much as possible. Um, select the stored forage system that makes the most sense for your operation um, based on how you're able to feed out um, feed out that stored forage. Get your forages tested regardless of what forage uh, you choose to use and provide supplements only when necessary um, to maintain uh, adequate body condition score of our cow herd. And with that, I'd be happy to take any questions. All right, thank you very much, Dr. Van Valen. Uh, remember, anybody, if you have any questions, uh, please put them in the chat and um, we will get right to it. Uh, we actually have one here. It's uh, from John Likens. Does anyone use Mix 30 as a supplement feed during winter months to, to dry cows? And what's your thoughts on that? Yeah, so Mix 30 is a... Um, a liquid supplement feed uh, that's great, that's high energy. Um, again, we got to think if you're thinking about dry cows, we got to think about if we're meeting those nutritional requirements with our stored forages, then maybe we don't need to utilize uh, any supplement at that point. So we're going to be for time 30 or another uh, source of, of supplemental feed. It ultimately becomes comes down to what's the protein and energy in our forage base and, and what do we need to, to add in on top of that. So um, I know that's a, that is a, a popular feed in this area. And, and like I said, it's, um, you know, it can be, can be utilized if, but if we need it, so. So I, I think that's the answer to this other one that I have. One of our friends that's uh, one of our co-specialists, uh, Katie, sent a text to me and said, you nutritionists make it too difficult. Just put a tub out there. Uh, what's your comment to that person? <laughs> so I'm not anti-tub. Tubs are expensive because tubs are convenient. And you've got to look we got to sit down and, and do some math uh, and do a little um, crunching of some numbers uh, because you may, a lot of it comes down to how much of that tub they're going to be able to consume. And so 
if they're not going to be able to consume enough of the tub to still meet that protein shortfall in the hay or the energy shortfall in the hay, uh, then we're still going to have to provide another uh, mechanism of getting that, those supplemental nutrients in. So uh, in cases where maybe it's just a little bit short or uh, you really do need that, that convenience factor, uh, you might, you know, it may, may fit the bill, um, but I would encourage you to crunch those numbers. That sounds good. All right, Philip Kanopka, San Ann, what are your thoughts on feeding lower quality hay in July and August to allow the fescue to stockpile? Yeah, that's a good question. And, and that definitely um, can work, especially if you've got um, maybe even some lower quality leftover hay from the year before uh, that you need to feed out. Um, another potential option there would be looking at um, a summer annual. Uh, if you've got the, the land to do that in your forage program, you know, to pull them off your fescue uh, and put something in like a, a warm season annual uh, to get them by in that lull when the fescue's not growing uh, quite so much. Uh, but ultimately you'll still need something probably to get them through that last bit of fall. So yeah, using a, a lower quality hay and at that point in time, assuming it matches with the uh, nutritional requirements of your of your uh, cow herd. Okay, generated a lot of questions, Dr. Van Valen. I uh, have another one here. What are some advantage to feeding wet distiller's grain versus dry? And followed up with, is it only the cost? So uh, wet versus dry, it's not necessarily cost. The other thing you need to think about is um, convenience of, of feeding the, a wet distillers versus a dry. Um, if you're looking at, at wet distillers, you're going to be hauling quite a bit of, of water uh, down the road as well. So, um, you know, in terms of, of matching nutrients, you know, you, you're, they'll, they can both be used as a supplemental feed source, but you, again, that's a, one of those situations where I think you need to, um, to look at uh, the, the rest of the system in terms of, again, getting that, all that water down the road and, and uh, being able to feed that throughout the winter. Okay, good. Uh, Susan Fox just sent in and said, how much would you increase energy under very cold, wet conditions? Yeah. Uh, so during um, cold and wet conditions, uh, that can, can vary uh, depending on not just the, the environmental factor, but also on the um, uh, stage of production and also the condition of the cattle uh, that we're talking about. And so, um, you know, putting out, you know, another uh, pound or two, depending on what you're, what you're feeding um, might, might help get them by. I think luckily here in Kentucky, uh, we don't, we tend to have some shorter spells of that, that real cold weather. Um, so hopefully that is also going to help us get them through, through that. But again, it's all about um, keeping an eye, managing body condition on those cows. Okay, had a, another private one sent in. For fall calving cows, can creep improve reproduction of cows? So providing, um, for thinking about providing creep feed to um I guess yeah. probably probably getting that you know is is that going to relieve the cows you know her how much she's putting into the milk aspect of it is where I think that question is going. Yeah, um, you know she's she's when they're when they're still young like that there's um, you know depending on where they're at that may may help another another um, factor if we get into a, a case where. Um, we really are, are tight on forages. We've got a, a bad year. Um, another potential option might be to, to look at early weaning, uh, which would, you know, allow that cow to dry up um, and, and stop her, stop producing milk and stop lactation early. So that may be another um, 
management decision to look at in those years that where we become really, really short on forages. But luckily this year it's been a pretty, if there's one positive to 2020, a lot of areas in the state had a good uh, forage year. Yep. And, and you know, the local geneticists would say that uh, if you ever have an issues with uh, cows milking too much, then reduce the amount of milk you're putting in the cows. So. Yep. Any other questions out there? Good, good discussion tonight. All right, I've, I put up the slide uh, for next week. And also for those of you that are needing the CAPE educational, uh, the CAPE code for tonight is the same as the password. So beef feed, uh, and that goes in the, the instructor signature box and uh, communicate with your county agent. Uh, some are requiring a little extra um, in order to get the, the CAPE credit. And so, uh, and it does always have to go through and be approved through the county agent. So uh, if you have any questions or need any additional information in terms of your particular county CAPE program, uh, contact your agent. Uh, next, or not next week, I got to get over that. Uh, November 10th uh, is the next session, and that's going to be, be winter feeding structures, and that's Dr. Steve Higgins. Uh, a lot of you know Dr. Higgins, and he uh, he, he does a, a great job, has done a lot of work up at the Eden Shell Farm uh, in, in terms of some of these winter feeding structures and uh, has a lot of information, a lot of practical uh, information for you guys on, on how to get you set up uh, with some of these structures that's gonna help uh, maybe clean up your pastures a little bit. It's been so wet the last couple of winters. Uh, now, I don't wanna curse us. I don't want us to go into extremely dry winters, but uh, we've all dealt with a lot of mud the last two winters. And so uh, some of his ideas are certainly gonna, gonna help out with that. So join us then for some more from Dr. Higgins and uh, bring us up to date on some of those structure, that structure work he's done. Um, any other questions? If you have any last minute questions, get them typed in here quickly. I'm not gonna keep you guys forever unless you have some discussion to go. All right, Dr. Van Valen, looks like they're gonna let you off the hook. Uh, a lot of compliments tonight, uh, great job. And um, we'll see everybody on November 10th. Please stay safe, take care of yourselves. And uh, I guess we're gonna have a big event between now and then, hopefully hopefully everything will, uh, will, will still be in existence then. So uh, we'll see what happens. So look forward to joining or seeing all you guys on November 10th. Uh, thank you, Dr. Van Balen. Everybody have a great night. Good night.